So I have a question for you. If you had to take a medication, an involuntary medication, you had, this means you have no choice as to whether or not you're going to receive the medication. If you don't accept it orally, you'll be given an injection. If you had to take an involuntary medication, would you want to know the medication's side effects? And would you want to know the side effects even if the side effects were horrible? Weight gain, heart problems, profound sedation, increased blood sugar, potentially diabetes, a lower life expectancy. Would you want to know all of that if you had no choice? Leave me a comment and give me an explanation as to why you'd want to know the side effects or why you wouldn't want to know the side effects. I'm asking you this because I found a pretty interesting article. I was looking for just random articles on PubMed that related to mental health nursing, looking for some inspiration, and I came across this article. It's called Mental Health Nursing, The Craft of the Impossible. It was a guest editorial written in the Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health Nursing in 2006. It was written by a lovely gentleman by the name of, I think his first name is Philip Barker. I sent him an email just because I got real sad when I was reading this article and it just brought up a lot of ethical issues and emotional junk for me when I was reading it. And he's a visiting professor at Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. And the whole article is, is really a, a, a great read. For the purposes of this YouTube video, I want to cover about kind of halfway through because as I was reading this, I was like, God, this would be interesting to talk about. And I'd like to hear other people's feedback, especially nurses out there who work in mental health. So let's just start right in the middle. And he says, I meet nurses every day who fail to advise people taking psychotropic drugs that they risk becoming diabetic, developing heart problems, losing their libido, and becoming impotent, among various other physical health problems. And when I'm reading this, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is my experience at the state hospital when we would hold these nursing groups as a nurse. And so you'd sit in this giant day hall with maybe 20 to 30 patients in front of you. You'd have this nursing group where you might talk about anything that's kind of nursing related. And really the topic could be anything. Oftentimes I would talk about psychotropic medication namely antipsychotics. And invariably what comes up are side effects of the medication. And I would always try to hold my nursing groups kind of in this Socratic dialogue, asking people about their medication, how it made them feel, and then from there kind of discuss side effects. Well, the reality is so many people experience side effects. In fact, I don't even like to call them side effects. They're really just effects, expected effects of the medication, unwanted expected effects of the medication, that when you're giving your nursing group, you feel like you're pretty much just talking about the side effects of the medication, the detrimental side effects of the medication. And then I started to wonder, God, would I want to know this? If I was a patient here and I was on involuntary meds, would I want to know all the side effects of the medication I'm taking? Now, granted, if it was voluntary medication and I had a choice, of course I would want to know the side effects because then I could make a decision. Hey, I could actually weigh the benefits and the detriments, the pros and cons of the medication before actually taking it. And probably more often than not, I would say, okay, no, after reading the long side effect list, this is not a medication that I would want. But I was thinking like at the state hospital, would I want to know? Because I almost feel like it's untherapeutic to discuss these side effects with people taking involuntary medications, which is why when I started this video, I asked you to leave me a comment because I'm not really sure. And honestly, even while I'm making this video, I'm not sure if I would want to know the side effects. Because if I don't have a choice to take the medication and, I, and after hearing all the side effects, I'm like, sweet mother of God, I don't want to take this medication. Well, I don't have a choice. I'm still going to have to take it. And so then I guess the risk becomes psychological at that that point. Because I would argue if someone knows the potential side effects, they might be more likely to experience them or at a minimum, at least have a lot of anxiety surrounding taking the medication that they otherwise thought was probably going to maybe help them. Anyhow, let's get back to our article. Given that many nurses today are university graduates, I am astonished at the huge numbers of younger nurses who are blissfully ignorant of the history of psychotropic drugs and especially are unaware that the key function of many such drugs is to induce brain damage. Well, I can tell you this much, I come from one of those universities. I have a BSN in nursing and we had one course in, in psych. It was one semester long. Actually, it was an accelerated program. So whatever that would be, I think it was still, maybe it was a quarter. It wasn't that long of a course. All I remember is that we didn't really talk about the history of medication. We didn't talk about how it affected the brain or how it damaged the brain or the number of side effects. We might have just sort of gave them a cursory overview of the side effects, but we didn't really go into detail about any of them. All the information that I pretty much know about psychotropic medication comes from my own research. So I don't really think the universities, if I can just extrapolate from my own experience and generalize from my own experience, really give that much information about the harms of psychotropic medication. In fact, after speaking 
speaking with a number of other nurses who have worked in mental health, a lot of them don't seem to understand the profound side effects of psychotropic medication. Nor do we really understand the history of psychotropic drugs. It was only after reading Anatomy of an Epidemic, just a wonderful book by Robert Whitaker, that I really felt that I had a better understanding of the history of psychotropic medication. So the article continues, in particular, few practice level nurses are aware that the original chemical kosh, I had to look up the word kosh, apparently that just means to kind of bludgeon or hit something. The original chemical kosh, chlorpromazine or thorazine, superseded the brain damaging therapies of the 1930s, insulin coma, electric shock, and lobotomy. So we used to put people in insulin comas, give them a large amount of insulin, they would go into a coma for, I think up to sometimes two weeks, these were the insane, and they thought at the time that was therapeutic for them. So insulin coma, electric shock, and lobotomy for the simple reason that chlorpromazine was more efficient in generating the passivity considered desirable by psychiatric professionals or patients' families. And that's generally been kind of my hunch as I read about older therapies for people with mental illness is that drugs like Thorazine, the antipsychotics, Haldol, Zyprexa, Clozril, etc. replaced some of those older therapies because they're just more efficient, they're more convenient, they require less monitoring, they're safer to some degree. And even as I work as a mental health nurse today, sometimes I think the reason we give out these medications is because it's convenient. It's a convenient way to temporarily handle and to deal with someone else's mental illness. Doesn't mean this is a good way, it just means it's a convenient way. The article continues, Deniker and DeLay, the original researchers, coined the term neuroleptic from the Greek to take hold of the nervous system. So these two researchers, Pierre Deniker, I don't even know if I'm saying their name right, was involved jointly with Jean Delay and Harl in the introduction of Thorazine, the first antipsychotic used in the treatment of schizophrenia in the 1950s. So the word neuroleptic means to take hold of the nervous system. They had discovered the ideal chemical restraint and could now dispense with the straitjacket. That patients became apathetic, lacked initiative, and lost interest in their surrounding was good news. Ironically, even today, psychiatric professionals describe these intended effects disingenuously as side effects. So this is something that's always piqued my curiosity. What exactly is a side effect? If you know what exactly a side effect is, let me know because I'm still kind of confused what a side effect is. For instance, if I give a medication and that medication always results in symptom X, Y, and Z, is that a side effect or is that an effect of the medication? And why is it called side effect? I really feel like we're going to have to delve into the history of side effects and who coined the term side effect. And why do we have to put this word side before this word effect? Let me give you an example. If you take an antipsychotic medication, like say Zyprexa, and someone says, yeah, one of the side effects is sedation. I say, well, why would it be a side effect if everyone who takes that medication is going to experience that effect? Why would we call it a side effect? I guess a side effect to me is something that occurs maybe less than 10% of the time. I feel like there's got to be some sort of probability associated with side effect. It can't happen so frequently that it's almost an intended or expected effect, if you know what I mean. So the article continues, the function of the neuroleptic is to damage the brain, slowing down its function and otherwise pacifying the mad patient. And for those of you who work in mental health, if you see someone take an antipsychotic, you'll notice it does exactly those things. People become lethargic. There's almost this slowness you can perceive in their brain and its functioning after they've received an antipsychotic medication. And I guess the way I would describe it is they just generally have a flat affect. They're more slow to respond when you ask them a question. They don't seem as spontaneous in conversation. And their general affect, in addition to being flat, looks very lethargic. It looks fatigued. It looks worn and exhausted. The article continues, chlorpromazine caused eerily similar deficits to encephalitis lethargica, which had affected over 5 million people between 1916 and 1927, only at a much faster pace. Encephalitis lethargica is a disease characterized by high fever, headache, double vision, delayed physical and mental response, and lethargy. In acute cases, patients may enter coma. Encephalitis lethargica is an atypical form form of encephalitis, which is just brain inflammation, also known as sleeping sickness or sleepy sickness. It was first described in 1917. The disease attacks the brain, leaving some victims in a statue-like condition, speechless and motorless. So that sounds like catatonia. Between 1915 and 1926, an epidemic of encephalitis lethargica spread around the world. The exact number of people infected is unknown, but it is estimated that more than 1 million people contracted the disease during the epidemic, which directly caused more than 500,000 deaths. 
Most of those who survived never returned to their pre-morbid vigor. Wow. If we look at the cause, they say the cause of encephalitis lethargica are uncertain. So they don't really know the cause. I think Dr. Barker's point here is that this Thorazine, when it was introduced, caused very similar effects to encephalitis lethargica, which no one wanted, but yet was pretty much indistinguishable from someone taking Thorazine. He even continues, this led the original researchers to note that it would be possible to cause, to induce true encephalitis epidemics with new drugs. Today, a small number of patients are aware of the effects of neuroleptics and other psychotropic drugs. Thankfully, a few of this group know more about their effects than the nurses who try to coax them into taking them. How many nurses describe in actual detail the potential short and long-term damage to both the nervous and other systems from use of psychotropic drugs? I could not begin to hazard a guess, but this must surely be a topic of urgent concern to a profession which risks breaching Nightingale's first rule to do the patients no harm. And when I read this, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is so many patients are unaware of the effects of their medication. And it's like, okay, well, when you were prescribed that medication, didn't you and your doctor discuss these effects? And usually they will say no. Now, I don't know if that's true. Maybe they forget, but my hunch is that they probably weren't really given a detailed explanation of the side effects. And that's because if they were, they were probably like, you know what? After you talk about all these side effects, I'm going to pass. I mean, check this out. Let's go to Google, right? And let's type in, imagine you're a patient and we're going to, let's pretend like we're going to be prescribed Abilify. So we type in Abilify package insert and we click this lovely bad boy right here a solid 84 pages this thing is already intimidating we can look at indications and usage it's indicated for schizophrenia acute treatment of manic and mixed episodes with bipolar one adjunctive treatment of major depressive disorder irritability associated with autistic disorder sweet mother treatment of Tourette's disorder agitation associated with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or bipolar mania we might peek at the adverse reactions adult patients with schizophrenia akathisia pediatric patients with schizophrenia extrapyramidal disorders somnolence and tremor i mean if we look there's already a, a number of side effects right in this area that are very concerning and it wouldn't take us long for us to run into this warning and precautions and you just read through all of these and they're pretty darn scary i mean why would we ever want to take this medication and maybe that is maybe that is why prescribers aren't going through all the side effects with patients and maybe that's their justification they feel like well you know what if we went through all these side effects they're going to say no to the medication but i feel like it's going to i feel like this medication is going to help with their psychosis so we'll just kind of give them a cursory overview but we're not going to go into that much detail which doesn't justify it whatsoever but i'm just saying that might be their rationale so the article continues this journal has published studies describing how many nurses appear untroubled ethically about about coercing patients to accept neuroleptic medication or report the effect of so-called side effects, noting casually how sufferers can experience a wide range of distressing, embarrassing, debilitating, and sometimes fatal side effects. And I can absolutely attest to this. When I worked at the state hospital, I would say the default is that nurses are untroubled by giving someone an, un, an, an involuntary medication. And, and still to this day, it makes absolutely no sense to me. It's like, do people actually think about this at all? Or I wonder if they've just been in the field for so long that they've kind of suppressed it and they just sort of accept it as everyday part of their life. I don't really know. I guess I didn't really ask a whole lot of nurses how they felt about giving involuntary medication. I think for a lot of us nurses, we probably just sort of justify it as, well, it's not really us who's ordered the involuntary medication. We're just kind of following orders. We're administering it, and it's up to the psychiatrist as to whether or not the involuntary medication is appropriate. And perhaps that's how a lot of us justify it. Nevertheless, even with a lot of nurses that I worked with, there didn't seem to be much hesitancy surrounding giving involuntary medication. But who knows? It's hard to say. I mean, it takes a lot of gumption to speak up on a patient's behalf in a psychiatric setting. So I don't really know. I don't want to pretend like I'm reading other nurses' minds. These studies suggest that some nurses and researchers are perched perilously on the edge of reason. Much of society's unreasonable and enduring affection for psychiatric treatment pivots around the hidden story of recovery, especially from the so-called serious and enduring disorders like schizophrenia. It has long been known that at least one-third of people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia recover completely. However, how many nurses have a working theory of recovery? Well, I can tell you, I mean, none of us really have a working theory of recovery. In fact, I didn't even know that one third of people diagnosed with schizophrenia actually recover. The original long-term studies of chronic schizophrenics discharged from hospitals showed that those who recovered were those who weaned themselves off their neuroleptic 
drugs. Such findings echoed the studies of the much higher recovery rates from schizophrenia in developing nations where drug treatment is rarely possible, and the studies by people like Lauren Mosher who emphasize psychosocial support with negligible drug treatment. So I do remember in this book here, Anatomy of an Epidemic, Robert Whitaker does talk about recovery rates in other countries that don't rely so heavily on neuroleptic medication, and it appears those countries have better recovery rates. Now, obviously, this is not like necessarily an apple-to-apple -apple comparison because what works in one nation might not work in another nation, especially when they come from entirely different cultures. They might perceive mental illness differently. They might define mental illness differently, etc. But it is worth noting, I think. So I think I'm going to end it there. The article goes into some other stuff that's not related to what we were just talking about. And I'm just kind of curious, though, what are your thoughts about the side effects, about involuntary medications? For those of you out there who might be mental health nurses, what is your thought about what we talked about in this video? And have you given an involuntary medication? And what was it like for you?